Hello and welcome to Dental Anatomy Tips and Tricks video and in this video we'll be going over a little bit about the instruments that we use in dental anatomy and how we utilize them in our wax ups of teeth. To begin I'll start with just going over the naming of each instrument so that we're all on the same page here. So I'll use this little number seven spatula here out in the corner and this is our half holland bag. It is probably one of the most widely used instruments that we use in dental anatomy. It's extremely versatile and has a whole range of different motions and techniques that we can use with it. It has two sides, it has a flat side here, and the other side, which is 90 degrees from the other head, which is great when you're trying to manipulate around different cusps on the tooth. I'll also go over some of the uh, anatomy of the teeth as well, so that when I'm talking about a specific area of the tooth, we can all understand what that area is exactly. <laughs> the next instrument we have is a discoid cleoid. This is the cleoid aspect of it. It is a spe um, kind of a circular instrument on this end, which is great for removing blebs on stone or during waxing. Um, you can use it in burnishing motions and um, other ways. It has this other side here, the cleoid end, and this is shaped more like a pear of sorts and has similar action. The next we have a tanner carver, which has two ends on it, a larger spherical end that is significantly larger than the cleoid end of the discoid cleoid, as you can see here. So this is the tanner carver, and the other end is right here, and it's a little bit larger than the discoid cleoid, and they're used for different things in different areas. The next two instruments are the PKT instruments, and there's essentially four ends to them. We have go with the smallest end first, which is here, and this end actually comes to a point that you can see. And that point is really useful for getting that fine anatomy in your grooves and or using the edge of it to burnish and get out the rough spots. And I'll talk about all these terms later in the video too. And this is the smaller one. It has this end which is sharp and this end which is approximately the same size but blunt. Here's the next larger increment here. It's about the same, but when you're actually holding an instrument, you can tell a definite difference. And here's the large end. This is tooth number 19, the left first mandibular molar. And to begin, we'll start with the basic sides of the tooth. We have our distal side here, mesial side here, the lingual, and the buccal. By no means is this an exhaustive list of dental anatomy, but this gives us a basic introduction to it so we can start talking about the different aspects of the tooth. This tooth normally has five cusps. The mesial buccal, the distal buccal, the distal, the distolingual, and the mesiolingual. To begin with some basic anatomy, we have various triangular ridges, which are these right here. And it forms a triangular shape, that's why we call it that. And there's one for each cusp, and that's the primary anatomy on the tooth. The triangular ridges also connect to each other in this mandibular first molar to create transverse ridges. Here's one example of the transverse ridge, and here's another example of a transverse ridge. This tooth also has a central groove, has all teeth, and has a W shape. And that's very important when we get into the occlusion of teeth and how they come together. For the pits, there are several. We have our main distal pit. Some people also call this the distal pit. We have a central pit, a second central pit here and our mesial pit right here. 
If we follow our buckle groove, it'll lead us into the buckle pit, which is right here. Turn that. Kind of looks like a little bit like a belly button. A fossa is the area kind of surrounding the pits. So we have our distal fossa here, depression, our central fossa, including these two central pits, and we have our mesial fossa right here. Here we have an occlusal view of tooth number three, the first maxillary molar in the right quadrant. Our mesial aspect, the distal aspect, lingual, and buccal. Our mesial buccal cusp, the distal buccal cusp, the distal lingual cusp, the mesial lingual cusp, and this tiny one over here is the cusp of carabelli and is sometimes present on maxillary first molars. We can apply many of the same terms that we used for tooth number 19 earlier on tooth 3. One big difference though is that maxillary first molars have an oblique ridge and that's this ridge right here and it's called oblique because it's going diagonally across the tooth from the mesial lingual cusp to the distal buccal cusp. There's also a prominent lingual ridge or lingual groove that we have. This is tooth number 30 a wax up that I've been working on recently, and I'd like to go over some of the basic te techniques of using these instruments. First, I'll demonstrate the half Holland back instrument, and for this, it has a few different motions that we can do. One that I call burnishing, and another that's cutting. The first motion, burnishing, really used to smooth out the wax, and what you're doing is just using the side of the instrument to essentially create a little friction that will melt the very, very surface of the wax to make it nice and smooth. The second technique is cutting. And to cut, what you do is you turn the half hollow back blade 90 degrees towards the tooth and you physically scrape away little layers. And this is great for taking away a lot of wax very quickly. The PKT instruments are all used in a similar way. We use them to burnish different surfaces of the tooth to smooth out rough lines and cuts that we may have made earlier. The next instrument is the discoid cleoid. So here I have the cleoid end, the one that looks kind of like a pear, and I'll use this in the central groove to kind of just carve out the groove initially. You can also use the other side of it, the rounded portion, in a burnishing motion as well. The tanner carver works in the same way as the discoid cleoid, in cutting and burnishing motions. Burnishing motions and cutting motions, depending how you use it. The next somewhat instrument I don't really talk about is this brush though. And just give it a couple swipes along the occlusal surface, along the sides of the tooth, and it gets all the gunk out, and now it's looking better. Remember to always give your tooth a quick brush before you show it to your instructors. They really appreciate clean work. The next technique I want to show you is how to polish a tooth. Really, this should be done at the very end once you've finished your tooth. By finishing, I mean you've taken away all of the rough surfaces. Nothing should be smooth. You see this little area here? It's slightly rough there. And that is something that I would want to finish before I polish. But for the sake of time, I'm going to show you how to polish this. Polishing should be done quickly and efficiently. If it's done too much or too aggressively, it'll actually strip away the uppermost layer of your wax. And that can be detectable when you're trying to test occlusion. The first thing you want to do is get a cotton ball like this, which I have with just some standard pink hand soap that you can find at any of the sinks. Make it damp, and what you're going to do is just move along the tooth, getting all those various 
areas. It shouldn't take too long. The solvents in the soap break down the uppermost layer of wax and give it a nice glossy and smooth feel to it. After the soap layer, take a dry cotton ball, which is kind of hard to see here, and take a dry cotton ball and start to clean it up. Get all that soap away. And then what I like to do at the very end is take an air water syringe and give it a quick blast of air to really make sure I've dried all that soap. And there you have it, how to polish your tooth. The next thing I want to show you about dental anatomy and waxing up is how to analyze your work so that you can improve it while you're working on it and after you've completed your project. What you need to do is look at your tooth in every way that you can possibly think of. Look at it from an occlusal view. Look at it from a mesial view down the tooth. Do the same with the distal. Look at it from the buckle. See what this looks like. See how that indentation is. Take an instrument. I like the PKT instrument because of its smooth and non-invasive um, action. And what you can do is just feel how that depression is and how far it goes. On your model tooth that you're going to have to replicate, you can use that and feel how deep that depression goes and then go to your own tooth, feel that depression, and if it's more or less, you'll need to know if you have to add or subtract wax. You can also use it to figure out the different angles in your central groove. If you're not sure if this angle is correct, take your model tooth and figure out what that feels like. And then go to your real tooth that you're working on and see how it feels like and compare them. You can also do this to see if your central pits or any pit is in the correct location. I like to take my instrument on the model tooth first and put it on the top of the cuss tip and then quickly move it into the pit. And then do that action several times. And what that does is it builds a bit of muscle memory of what that feels like. Then you go to your actual tooth that you're waxing up, this one, and you do the same thing. And you can feel if that central pit is at the same location and depth. Another thing you can do is use your perio probe to measure exactly how far away that pit is on your model tooth and on the tooth you're working on. One important aspect of waxing up is making sure that you have a continuous contour on your tooth. When you're trying to fill in this occlusal prep on number 19, you want to make sure that there's no difference between your enamel layer here that is already tooth and your wax. Now I'd like to teach you how to use the electronic wax adder in your kit. For this, it's pretty easy to just get little drops of wax adding to more wax. And what you'll be able to do is really position that drop exactly where you want it and how thick you want it. You can see here they're starting to turn cloudy, a little gray. That's a great moment to close an articulator if you're using one to test occlusion. Any warmer than that and the wax will stick to your opposing model. Any cooler and it's starting to get too cold now and you'll break your wax. To best use your wax adder make sure that you have the temperature properly set. I have mine at 350 degrees Fahrenheit right now on the smallest tip with the little bread handle. If it's too hot, you can always turn it down. If it's too cold, turn it up. Every wax adder is a little differently, different, so make sure to experiment. 